So, we're going to the movies tonight, are we? That's fine. Let's see if we can't make it a bit more interesting than usual. So settle yourselves back and look about you, because possibly your next seat neighbor is a man who, without knowing it, is heir to untold millions, heir to a throne, a king without a crown. Paris, 1793, the French Revolution. Louis XVI had sat on the throne of France, his wife the one-time frightened little Austrian princess known as Marie Antoinette. Now, whenever an angry citizenry has wanted to get rid of its king, it has generally insisted on an act of abdication. But without this abdication, a king's death automatically makes his eldest son king in his stead. In a prison cell, the crushed and grieving Marie Antoinette endures the ghastly moment when the thundering knife takes from her husband his heritage of life. The king is dead. Long live the king. The king? Yes, King Louis the Seventeenth whom history best remembers as the Dauphin, that ancient title given France's eldest royal son. But now a king, a tragic little king, for his worshipful subjects consist only of his mother, his sister Marie, and his aunt, the Princess Elizabeth, sister of that king whose life has just ebbed away on the guillotine platform. Poor little Louis the Seventeenth, king of France, a king without a crown, a king without a throne, a king without a country. But further tragedy is to come to the sleepy, frightened child and the bereaved, harassed mother. Even the thin comforter in prison is short-lived. For suddenly the terror strikes again. The revolution demands the baby king when an edict tears him from his mother's arms. Why? Because he is, in theory, the heir to the French throne, if not, in fact, the occupant of it. And no doubt the tortured mother realizes that before her eyes again shall see her boy, the guillotine will have blinded them forever. And the boy? His existence was regarded as a key to the end of the bloody conflict raging between citizen and aristocrat. An answer to the question, shall France be kingdom or republic? What happened to him? Shrewd thinkers among the revolutionists anticipated the possibility of using the living child as a pawn to bargain with. Many thousands of the blood-crazed rabble hungered for his life, unreasoning as they were in the hysterical reign of terror. Disguised royalists, plotting a return of the monarchy, planned to rescue their king, about whom they might rally a counter-revolution. But then, according to the garbled chronicles, disease and death and a hasty funeral decided this struggle for the life of a boy king. But let us see. No historian is completely satisfied with the contradictory stories of the Dauphin's fate. What actually did happen? Our story moves forward 50 years to the town of Green Bay, Wisconsin, buzzing with excitement. That morning has arrived the Prince de Joinville, son of Louis Philippe, now King of France. Buzzing excitement, then intense curiosity, for the Prince has summoned Eliezer Williams, a missionary among the Indians, to a private interview at the village tavern. What can a king's son want of a humble pioneer minister? According to one story, this. Before I come to the real purpose of this visit, I must have certain personal information from you. Yes, Your Highness. In your own mind, are you satisfied that you were born an American Indian? Yes, Your Highness. My mother was a full-blooded Indian woman. There was a strain of the white man in my father's blood, but he was born and lived as an Indian. Your earliest childhood, do you retain clear recollections of it? No. My earliest memories are clouded. The result, I'm told, of serious illness as a boy. What you tell me confirms the inquiries I have made about you. Now it is my duty to tell you a strange story. Fifty years ago, Paris was in the grip of a reign of terror. Shortly after the public execution of Marie Antoinette, it was announced that her son, the Dauphin, had died in prison of disease and neglect. But that report was false. The Dauphin was not dead. On the night before his reported death, everything was in readiness for a bold venture. The rescue and escape from prison of the Dauphin. A boy from the slums of Paris, near death from a loathsome disease, was carried into the prison and left in the place of the Dauphin. 
The boy was hidden away until rumours of the plot had died down. Then he was conveyed secretly to a ship bound for America. He was placed with a family of Indians to await the time when loyal supporters of the monarchy could place him on the throne of France. But that time never came. The boy grew up here in America and became a missionary among the Indians. You are the dolphin. No, you've made a mistake. There is no mistake. I have traced your life back to its very beginnings. You are the dolphin. Why have you come here? Today there are men who would once more plunge France into civil strife. They search for the dolphin to place him on the throne now held by my father. I am here to forestall such a possibility. By what means? By your signature to this agreement of abdication, giving up your right and the right of your descendants to the throne of France. I cannot sign this paper. You must sign. The peace and happiness of France de The throne of a king is not for me. I'm a simple servant of the church. I shall continue so to the end of my days. And with God as my witness, I promise I shall do nothing that may prejudice the welfare of France. I'm convinced we have nothing to fear from you, Reverend Sir. But your refusal to sign this abdication... I have a son and I've no right to destroy his royal heritage. But believe me when I say I shall always urge him to live and die as he was born, an American. According to one story, I said, according to the story Eliezer Williams confided to his diary, the story that was found and published reaching ten years later to France itself, where the Dauphin's little sister Marie, now the Duchess of Angoulême, lies grievously ill. Held to life itself by the slim thread of her hope that Eliezer Williams' story can be authenticated. To settle this, she has summoned the Prince de Joinville, a prince you'll remember, whose father might be illegally wearing France's crown. Cousin, I have not long to live. You must give me Prince Williams, my brother, the dolphin who was taken from the temple prison 60 years ago. Madame, the story of Eliezer Williams is the invention of a disordered mind. He was well versed in the history of the region, and my sole object in meeting him was to obtain certain information concerning the early French settlers of the territory. Since my visit, he's become victim to delusions of grandeur, one of the many pretenders who claim the dolphin's identity. But I've seen a picture of him. He bears the features of our family. And the scar under his eye, my brother had such a mark. You were deceived, madame, by a strange coincidence, and your own wish to believe that the dolphin is still alive. Perhaps you're right. I may be deceived. So one of the great mystery, both the prince and the preacher attest to their meeting in Wisconsin. But what happened at that meeting? Did Eliezer Williams write a lie? Or did the prince lie to the dying duchess? Is there somewhere today, perhaps in this very audience, a king without a crown, descendant of Eliezer Williams who was or was not Louis the Seventeenth?